Hello, everyone. Thank you for us for the 2020 Student Advisory Board Program at the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Emily DePew, and I'm the student coordinator for the Student Advisory Board. And we're really excited to host our program um, for today, and that is the 2020 election campaign strategy, political strategy, and so forth. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank the Ford Motor Company Fund who um, gave the Student Advisory Board a grant to put this on. And additionally, Senator Nancy Kassebaum, who asked that her 2016 Dole Leadership Prize Cash Award use the support of student programs at the Dole Institute. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jeff Rowe and Christina Reynolds for joining us tonight. Jeff was the campaign manager for Ted Cruz's 2016 run for president and is the founder of Acting Strategies. Christina served as the deputy communications director at Hillary for America and now serves as the VP of communication at Emily's List. Before we get started with the program tonight, um, and questions, I'd like to note that there will be a Q&A session. So please place your questions for Jeff and Christina in the YouTube chat function throughout tonight's program. That YouTube chat function is at the right hand of your screen on YouTube. And like I said, please submit those questions throughout the program so we can answer them at the end. So to begin, um, I'll have Christina answer this question first and then Jeff can respond. What are the biggest shifts in political consulting and strategy in the past 10 years? Um, so first, I would just like to say thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I have gotten to participate in a Dole Institute program in the past, and it was great. You all do fantastic work, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I would say, I maybe extend a little beyond the 10 years, and just say, I, I do think that the advent of social media and particularly Twitter is one of the biggest, for communicators anyway, one of the biggest um, changes. I was the rapid response director for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign and we didn't use Twitter for rapid response. That's how far we've come. Now you have Twitter as a place to reach reporters. Um, you can obviously reach voters and people, but mo I would argue almost most importantly for the campaigns, reporters are there. It's where they get statements. It's where they sort of show what they think the narrative is. It's where the narrative can move. And sometimes that's to the detriment of some campaigns where you see the most vocal ones then tend to be, I think, overestimated in terms of potentially their, their share of the vote. Um, but I think that what social media can do and, and the ways it allows you to move around a media filter in some ways to reach voters directly is, is to me the biggest change we've seen. Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's kind of a loaded question. If you look at the, through, the, through the presidential lens, Christine is exactly right. In addition to what she said, it's also the, um, the massive uh, import of earned media. Earned media share has predicted every presidential election since Kennedy. And um, I think that, that, that the volume of coverage has driven our strategy to win that earned media share. Television is such an overwhelming, be it cable or over the top, OTT we call it, um, communication, and then broadcast television, which is still the kind of heavyweight in the room. Those, that, that media share has, has really driven our communication strategy to, and, and political strategy to shape around it. It has become the center point and everything spokes out from what the coverage will be like. And so that has forced people into different camps, both journalistically, and I know there's a lot of ethics in journalism, uh, but both journalistically and for coverage, it's driven them into either opinion type journalist or horse race breaking news journalist. And uh, for my take on it, it's, it's driven, the, the voters are moving to the to the edges of the elector, the electorate's moving away from the middle to the edges, and that therefore for for um, for the news media to to reach a certain group, they have to move with them 
And so you see this divide that happens. It's not politicians doing it. It's not the media doing it. It's the people doing it. And so therefore, when that divide is created, it leaves a big hole in the middle and, and a, you know, a lot of people fall in between it. So I think that's probably the, the biggest, for my take, the earned media share, while it's been going on for a while, the, uh, the power of that earned media share and the volume and for a presidential level, the velocity of, of, the, of media and its, imp and its impact on politics has really changed the game. People that are, do what Christina does are much more important than what people that do what I do are these days because communications, comms, you build your comm shop first in a campaign. You don't build your strategy team first. And so I think that's probably a big impact. So somewhere there are a bunch of communicators writing that down to put on their resume. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. I hope, I hope so. The next question I have kind of goes along the lines of communication and I'll have um, Jeff answer this question first and then turn it over to Christina. Now more than ever, how can candidates effectively use social media and online outlets to promote their campaigns? On whether we're talking about, should I frame these questions as it relates to presidential or should do you think I should do it more towards federal campaigns or campaigns in general? Because those would probably be two different answers. However you feel like you should answer it. I think um, we're going to try to focus more on uh, 2020 presidential campaign, but okay. if you would like to focus on other areas, feel free to do that as well. Yeah, it's the Dole Institute, right? It's not the Yoder Institute, so I'll stay on, I'll stay on presidential. Um, that's a shout out to my good congressman, former congressman, Kevin Yoder. Um, so I think that social media is, um, is a powerful tool, but I think that candidates um, will try and make things go viral when they're really not viral. And so one of the biggest things that I've found in our campaigns and for sure what the president does and what Vice President Biden should do is to do, and I, and I think, you know, right now, anyway, there's such a volume of information from Trump, from the president that he can do this, but you'd have to have feedback. And a lot of campaigns try and create this master plan to engage people on social media. They want to do what Obama did or what Trump does, or they want to use social media that way. And the reality is you have to just put out content and your content generation is going to lead. You have to make 99 mistakes to make the one hit and I think a lot of campaigns try and control that too much instead of just letting it flow and uh, so I think if if you're talking about the presidential race <clears throat> and I think that you know we will get to this I'm sure tonight but but the content that campaigns generate has to be constant it has to be what meet people at the moment it has to be the genre has to be important. It has to be appropriate and not tone deaf to the moment. And there's a, there's a reason why in a presidential, which is really unbelievable, but I mean, this happens, it happens all the time. If it didn't happen in the, in the White House, it happened on the road, that you get a question about Tiger, you know, Tiger King. I mean, the president needs to kind of know about that. And candidates certainly need to know about it. I think the president might be able to get a pass to not know about it, but like that, that is a meeting the voters where they are. And so I think one of the mistakes a lot of campaigns do is they try and constrict the content, not make any mistakes, not put anything out that's not fully done and fully baked and, and ready for prime time. Instead, just letting it go, make a bunch of mistakes, but meet voters where they are and elicit feedback. It's the most powerful word in politics is feedback. Two words, I guess. But um, that's why I think that's why I think a lot of campaigns miss the mark. And I think a lot of Democrat campaigns miss in this election cycle missed that mark. I mean, instead of just letting it fly, they tried to be too scripted or too tight. And, and a lot of campaigns made those same mistakes in 16 on the Republican side. Yeah, I mean, boy, second question. I am in full agreement with my Republican friend here. Um, I think that uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think the clearest example of that is what, you know, one of the biggest things on, Twitter and Instagram right now is Kamala Harris teaching Mark Warner how to make a um, a tuna melt that isn't as horrifying as the first one. He made, right? That was just a moment, um, but it was 
it was authentic and it was, you know, it was unique and it was funny and, and it felt real. And I, and I do think that's something um, that candidates need to remember. I, I'm with, I'm with Jeff in the um, more is better. I think, um, you know, you're going to get things wrong. That's okay. Let people see who you are. Um, and that, that authenticity voters expect some, what they consider authenticity now. Now we can have a debate. I think sometimes that's tough for women candidates because we don't, we haven't seen as many of them and things like that. But, but the reality is, You've got to be out there and you've got to use, you know, put out content. And the more you do that, the more you can then be creative. I'll give you an example. Like, um, this is not a presidential race, but in, a, in a, one of our House um, candidates, she is now a, a Congresswoman, Kim Schreier is a pediatrician. She's the only pediatrician in Congress. She did a Facebook Live little a town hall for kids to talk to them about the coronavirus that's an interesting and creative use of um use of social media in a way that shows her skills um and and is interesting and of the moment so it kind of checks those boxes that that jeff mentioned and and i think that's um that's something that candidates really need to remember um, and that applies up and down, you know, the ballot. Um, but it's but it's true for for presidentials too. Um, you know, you're going to drop a lot of social out there. You're going to drop a lot of the videos and the content and things like that. It's not all going to land. But think about your audiences. Think about where they are. Vary it up, um, and get out there and speak to who your candidate is. Thank you, Jeff and Christina. Um, moving on to our third question away from um, social media to uh, campaign preparation. And I'll have Christina answer this one first and then go on to Jeff. What type of preparation goes into helping a candidate get ready for a debate? Um, so it's a good question. Um, I am a former researcher before I was in communication. So I spent a lot of my life dealing with debates. Um, you know, the things that go into a, de a debate prep starts long before the candidate is actually at a podium. And it starts with thinking about what's the strategy you want? What do you want to get out of the debate? And I think too often new candidates forget that and they just want to get their zingers and they want to have their moments. That's incredibly important. Um, Jeff raised the point about earned media and the importance of earned media. And you do have to figure out how to get in there. But you also want to want to know what's my strategy at the end of the debate what is a victory and i think a part of it particularly in these big crowded primaries is being mentioned um i've worked for a number of presidential candidates in big fields where you know you'd have at the end so and so and so and so also appeared and that's deadly you don't want to be that candidate right um but but you want to think about your strategy you want to do the research on what what are your opponents likely to say what do you want to say about them? What do you want to say about yourself? It's sort of a standard message box. Um, and then you also want to think about um, what are they going to come back with? So you need to do all of that. And then you need to, I think one of the, one of the forgotten pieces of prep is you need to prep in the format that the and the time that the um, that the debate's going to happen. It's a small and simple thing, but I have certainly worked for candidates that were morning people. And when you have nighttime debates, you got to get them used to that. I've worked for candidates that that were night owls, and I remember one. Uh, this week debate in Iowa that was something like 8 a.m. and my candidate didn't love it. So we had to practice that. Um, so, it, you know, it's a wide variety of things. Ideally, you have someone prep and be your, your opponent and you do all that. Um, but I think the, the first and most important step is strategy. What do you want to get out of it? What do you want on the news that night? Um, and what do you want the voters who are watching to walk away with? Yeah, man, we got to like mix it up there a little bit um, because I completely agree, of course. Um, I think that so I'll stick on presidential because down ballot uh, debates have much less impact and it's all nobody really watches them. And and the only thing you get is the really big misses and the really big hits in down ballot races. But for president, I think you have to think about two things. One, what do you want the headline to be for your supporters? And what do you want the key takeaway to be, um, you know, for, for, the, for the people that write the news? Like, how do you win a debate? That's always subjective and is, is measured in many, you know, 
fascinating, fascinating ways by the press. But, but what you really need to do is think about what is my headline for the debate? What, what if I say one thing, and I get there's 20 people on the stage and I'm going to get seven minutes because of where how many questions I'm going to get. You just don't get a couple. Run, you don't get a couple runs at this. You've got to. That's why you see people like us and probably like many people tonight watch all the debates. Like I watch every single debate, every minute of every single Democrat debate. And we are crazy sick people. I mean, it's about six percent of the population. And so that watch all the way through. Typically, you'll have. And even the Democrat debates, which I think we'll probably get to this, but the biggest debate, I think it was 23 million. The, the smallest debate was about 6 million. And so even in those numbers, those are total numbers over a one, two, three hour. That one felt like it was 14 hours. But the drop off after the first 20 minutes is like enormous. And so even in the most heavily watched, you're really only going to match or meet about, you know, 5% of the population. So it's really critical be strong early, sink your headline fast. And then the second decision you have to make in a debate, I call it, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm a pig farmer from Brookfield. So Brookfield, Missouri. So, you know, NASCAR is not a foreign language to me. We call it rub and paint. Are we going to hit somebody else or not? And uh, are we going to pick a fight with somebody? And if we do now, the research is going to be really critical now we're talking about what, what is their record? What can we survive a fact check on? Or how many Pinocchios are, are we going to get? And then what do we know that they're going to say in response? Because they're not going to answer our charge. They're going to hit us. So what is our weakness? What is our flank? At least topically, but kind of really, you know, anything they can pick at. So what's our biggest flank? What's our biggest weakness that we can, that we can take a flank on? What do we want to rub paint on? What do we want to try and make the story of the debate when they talk about Headline will always almost be candidate spar and pick the state forum or pick the state debate and or they'll pick the network candidate spar and candidates clash at the CNN debate. And then the headline will be X, Y and Z. So how do you get that headline? And then what is the debate about and how much did you drive the message? So protecting yourself. Do you go on the attack or not? Do you try and draw a distinction with somebody to make it clear to everybody, mainly print and cable journalist that that's who you're trying to beat and uh and, and making sure that your headline is sound and safe at the end of the night because you don't want to wait for your closing argument to make the point that you wanted to accomplish in the entire debate jeff i have a question for you if, if memory <laughs> serves um ted cruz is a a debate champion i believe right yeah. um, did that make it harder to prep him was he in a in a place of uh, i've already got this <laughs> So Ted's interesting. He'll love the. He'll love this. Hopefully nobody's going to tweet about this. Which I have a good luck on that. But um, he's a great. Uh, I wasn't in debate, so I don't know the, what you call it. But he was not. He was a great college debater, and I think he's very quick on his feet and, and somewhat quick witted. Sometimes he's a little off a half turn. But he, the thing that he wouldn't do that we really needed to do, and um, and we did it once, and he loved it, and it was awesome, and I think it was our best debate afterwards. Is he would never do mock. He didn't want to stand up there and do the mock. So his was, you know, what he's really good at it, flip a coin, you know, you got pro-life, you got pro-choice and argue it. And he could take either side. I mean, he's, he's fundamentally understands where he is positionally, but, and, and faithfully, but he could take either side and make the debate point. So it's about scoring points. I think when you talk about debate in, in college and in high school, but this was, uh, it was a frustrating moment for us. The first debate performance that we ever, or the first debate prep, I was new campaign manager, new to the team. I worked on the campaign against him when he ran for Senate, and then he hired me to run his presidential. So we had a, kind of a lot of that going on, and we set him up, and I've got a camera crew there, and we have his previous debates for the Senate race, and I got a podium, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And he just sits down, and he's like, yeah, we're not doing any of that. So I think <laughs> we finally got him into a place where, you know, he would do a little bit of mock. But that mock is really critical because if you like to talk too much, you don't realize how fast the 60 second goes and the 30 second response goes. And so he was a great, what we would do for our debate prep is he would sit in the room, we'd have his kind of both formal and informal advisors and we would have an agenda um, and we would just fire questions at him. 
and just over and over different questions. And then all of us pounce on him. He, it was like a WrestleMania type of thing. So he liked that. Um, that doesn't quite give him the quick timing that he needed. Um, also, we would do a, um, if we did, we would focus group the previous debates. So this lesson I learned in politics a long time ago is trying to make this relatable moment where tell us about the economics. Well, let me tell you about economics, what it means to me. And it's Joey, the bus driver that I met in Keokuk, Iowa, and how important it is. They, I mean, the voters hate that. I don't know when that happened, but it happened since I've been in politics because I was always trained. You always want to make it relatable to somebody and they just hated it. So we learned during the course of the debates, I think we had 13 of them, just get the punchline. And then if you got time to BS and make, you know, tell your story, you can, but voters were really turned off by the more and more political sounding speak that you get. So great question. And most of my candidates would really like to have mock. I mean, they kind of enjoy that theater of it as much as anything else, uh, but but not Cruz. He's he's uh, he'd rather be be pile drive by 19 people in a room than he would be, you know. And we did have a great impressionist of Donald Trump, but one out who's a you know friend of mine is Rick Tyler, who's now on MSNBC, worked for our campaign, and he was a Donald Trump impressionist, and he can do a wicked Donald Trump. Uh, talking about Donald Trump, that's going to be our next question. Um, this will actually go to, I think, Jeff first. And um, the question is that historically, most candidates have tried to shy away from negative optics. However, Trump took the approach in 2016 that all news is good news, and he got elected. Do you think this strategy will work for him in 2020? And does this strategy work for other candidates? Uh, so, well, I think all news is kind of good news. I mean, if you look at who won um, the, the, and I, there's a lot of factors and a whole lot going on and kudos to the Democrats for organizing the party and trying to figure this out. But Joe Biden led a lot of news cycles for bad reasons, how bad he was doing, how little money he raised, how you know poor his rollout was, or how he made this mistake or that mistake. But you know, Bernie had a few moments. Elizabeth Warren had a couple weeks. Kamala Harris had a couple weeks. Pete Buttigieg had a couple weeks. But if you look at overall weight of of television minutes, um, and Joe Biden did win that, and it predicted the nominee again. Now. There was, there was about a 96 hour period where it was blanketed and that really shaped the race and turned the race and those sorts of things happened. But yeah, I, I kind of agree. I mean, I, I do think that Trump is a Haley's comment. I mean, once every 70, 75 years, you get something like this, but he had a hundred percent name ID beforehand. And he was, he was a product leader from the standpoint that he was old. We were forced to react to him all the time. And so he did it tonight, right? He said something about bleach or something, and he's going to lead the news, and everybody's going to freak out about it. And then a couple of days, he's going to have a doctor come out and say that's not what we were talking about, and they'll clean it up. But he's dominated the news. I don't know what's trending on Twitter, but I bet it has something to do with bleach um, or disinfectant or not Lysol or something. So he controls the narrative in such a way. I, I've not seen it, but it takes two to tango, and so. He says something that people think is crazy. Everybody talks about it for 48 hours. Then he says something else that people think is crazy and they'll talk about it for 48 hours. And he's run this circuit now for about five years and no one ever got, I mean, no one against him has ever gotten the joke that just don't take the bait all the time. And uh, so from a 2020 perspective, it's very good because he's going to, do he's dominated for, you know, on un un um, unusual circumstances and, and disappointing circumstances and, it's for first time in our lifetime we've had a uh, a global pandemic that that the president does a two hour press conference every night and gets Sunday night football ratings every single day so that won't be you know here forever or usual in future election cycles but from a normal rate of of strength of message and driving what he wants to drive don't think that he's not knowing what he's doing when he's picking some of these things up. Don't think that that's an accident. I think maybe sometimes he stumbles into it. Maybe it's not quite purposeful, 
but his ability to double down and double down and double down and the strength that it would take for most politicians to do that is unmatched. He's a savant at what the press wants, what they need and what feeds them. Yeah, I mean, yet again, um, I agree with, I certainly, I think that no one controls the media or has sort of mastered how to control the media better than Donald Trump um, in our lifetimes. I, 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 I also agree, he is a Haley's Comet. I think there are a lot of people out there who think that they can be him. And I don't think it's, you know, it is not proven to work yet. Um, and I, I think that now, I, I also, um, you know, as, as as Jeff said, that there are a thousand reasons why every election wins and loses, right? And typically, we you know, we assume that the winner did everything right and the loser did everything wrong, and usually it's about half and half. And um, uh, and you know, that it's sort of that muddy middle is what makes all the difference. And I think that um, uh, Trump has certainly dominated the media. He will continue to do that. But the question to me is, you know, elections are fundamentally about the incumbent when there is one. And the polling is, you know, the polling on the things that he's talking about is not looking that great right now. When you look at where, where Americans are on things like stay at home orders, when you look at where Americans are on do they trust Trump versus do they trust their governors, um, things like that. It's not looking great. I don't know where we'll be in November. I hope that we're, you know, in a fundamentally different place. I hope we're having a different debate. Um, and I hope that um, we have come out of this. Um, you know, this is a place where I very much wish him success because I, I want this to be over and I think we all do. But, um, but I think that uh, the, the, his capture of the media is not something that is easily replicated. We see it a little bit on our side where I think there are people who, there are you know, particularly congressional candidates who say, well, I wanna be the next AOC. I wanna do what she did and that's gonna get me a win in my primary. And it's like, well, again, special circumstances, right? If she was in a place with a media market so large, you almost couldn't be in the media. Um, and, and you look at some of the special circumstances and also sometimes people um, have something that not everybody's got. And, and so you just can't replicate, you know, I'm gonna be Donald Trump and I'm gonna say these things and do these things and it's gonna work out the same for me. Um, so I don't, I think that there are many things that Donald Trump has fundamentally changed in our politics, but I don't think it's, you can just imitate Donald Trump and then that's, that's the key to success. I'll have Christina uh, take this next question first. Um, Democrats have coalesced under um, one candidate much faster than they did in 2008 and 2016. Will this additional time make it easier for Biden to persuade Sanders supporters to vote for him? Sorry, I was muted. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think, I mean, for one, this is not a normal time to communicate in a, you know, a, a challenger campaign. Um, there, there are lots of debates about what Joe Biden's doing and what should he be doing and so on and so forth. And um, I, I frankly think that the vice president is in a no-win situation right now, um, that it's, it's a tough time to not be in office and try and, and grab hold of the media when so much is going on um, that is happening in government. Um, and so it's not a normal time. It's not like he can be out doing rallies. Um, whatever you think he could be doing, it would be fundamentally different than any campaign that certainly Jeff or I have seen. Um, and so I don't know how much that extra time is gonna mean, but I will also say, what I think may make a difference, and we saw this in you know, a shortened amount of time when all of his challengers have endorsed him, a shortened amount of time when some of the more vocal voices um, on, the, on the left of the party or the more vocal voices against Biden at one point have come out in, in favor of him, which is what I think many Democrats view as the threat on the other side is so great that the, the risk is just too large. And I, and I think, unfortunately, in 2016, many Democrats just, be, just believed that Donald Trump couldn't win. And 
for that reason, they could, you know, hem and haw and, and gripe a little or decide they might vote third party or things like that. Um, because they just didn't think it was possible. And now it is possible and he's there. And I think for most Democrats, they're not happy with the way um, he is running things right now. And so, um, so I think that that fundamentally will make a huge difference with many voters. Um, it, it, is, it is not a normal time. So I don't think um, it's, it's like um, he had this amount of time in 2016 or in 2008. So to me, right, so um, I, I'm in the camp that the less Joe Biden campaigns, the better it's going to be for him. Um, I think that he's a, um, in, in the Democrats' mind, and occasionally in my mind, he was the best nominee for them because he was somewhat best vetted and somewhat tested. And, you know, they've seen him in a leadership role in the past, and he wouldn't risk kind of crazy town, you know, for them. And and he could win the three or four states that need to swing for Democrats to win the White House. But his consolidation is going to be a pretty bumpy ride. And I don't, so a couple of things. One, the consolidation is going to be defined by the VP nominee. And that, that war, they're having pretty decent wars inside the campaign. And I'll step back and talk about this for a second. Um, the, the Democrat party for the last two cycles has come this close to nominating um, Bernie Sanders to be their nominee. And one time probably, you know, should have won it. And the second time, you know, if he would have ran a better campaign, he would have won it. But he didn't put away Biden when he had the opportunity to put him away. So that's how left the party is. And that part of the party needs to have representation and they don't trust that Joe Biden will do it. And I finally get to mix it up a little bit with Christina. So I'll, I'll, I'll be grandiose about this. Um, they, they don't get to, like, they got one shot at this. And by the way, we've gone through this too. Donald Trump did not, did not campaign in the primaries as an as a economic and social conservative. And so he had a choice between Chris Christie and, and Mike Pence. And he chose the most conservative governor in the entire United States to be on his platform. And he didn't need Indiana, although Indiana performed about 8.8% better than it did in the previous cycle in Obama's reelect. But he made a decision, a consolidation decision, to consolidate the party and put out a list of judges he'd appoint, pick Mike Pence as, as his VP, and everybody was singing Kumbaya. Hillary Clinton didn't do that. She could have picked Tom Perez, Hispanic. She could have picked Cory Booker, who she vetted. She could have picked Tom Vilsack, who wouldn't have done anything for her, but maybe helped her in Iowa. But instead, she picked literally the most only other Democrat that I can think of more boring than her, and that's Tim Kaine, who got 0.8% better in Virginia, which she was already going to win anyway, added no depth to the ticket. She probably picked him because she thought she was going to win, and he probably would have been a magnificent VP. So um, the, she now, I'm sorry, Biden now has eliminated half the Democrats that were running, there were men, so there's no men going to be on the ticket. So that was a good first step for him for consolidation. But now he has a big choice. And I believe his big choice because he's, at, he's in my opinion, he's already disqualified a few people when he said the number one test that he has to make, which is a great answer. I don't think it's a great answer for him personally, but it's the right answer for a president is if something happens to me, they could be president. That's his number one selection. He just said it the other night on, on, James Corden, of all people, although carpool karaoke is much watch every time, but interesting place to, you know, announce your VP, you know, selection criteria. So he says that he's going to have a, a, I think that probably kicks out a few people. And I'd be in the camp thinking that it probably kicks out Stacey Abrams, although she will still mount a valiant campaign to be vice president. State representative to VP is a big step. Mayor will still, uh, I get to come back, but still, I think it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a big step. So he essentially has a choice between Amy Klobuchar and the governor of, of Michigan, whose name I butcher all the time, so I'm not going to try. I think it's Whitmer and Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren. And those are really, there's Val Demings, who's a, who's a sleeper pick. And I don't know her very well. She hasn't been vetted the same way, but he's really got a decision. And then the Biden campaign, from my purview, he has the old Biden people 
who were centrist, moderate, mainline Democrats. He's got the new crew of which I've ran a couple campaigns against in big theater combat zones, and they are base campaigners. They don't, the, the middle is vanishing. I happen to believe this as well. The middle is vanishing and we got to get, we have to get the 70 million votes and we're having an easier time getting there by firing up our base than we are by meeting, trying to get some middle voter in Miami-Dade County that doesn't exist. So that decision that they make is really going to decide whether he can consolidate the party. Some will say that Donald Trump consolidates the Democrat party for them. That's what we thought. That's what we thought with Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan. We thought that Barack Obama, we don't need to have any energy on our side. We can pick an aristocrat nominee with a austerity based speaker and run a campaign with these two folks who will go do a great job in government for Republican principles. And we thought that there was going to be this middle that they would win because Obama had gone off the cliff and carbon tax and blah, 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 and blah, blah, almost like a moderate Democrat now, surprisingly enough. But we thought that we could just have Barack Obama motivate our base and all Republicans will come out no matter who our nominee is. We kind of thought that with John McCain to, to a certain degree, but we certainly thought with Mitt Romney and it doesn't work. And so Biden has this warring factions. You see it with how they're going to build their their um, their data file. Do they use Bloomberg's company or do they build it in house with a bunch of uh, of uh, progressive operatives like this thing is I mean. I'm not in any, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't bugged the DNC. Um, so I don't, you just see how this stuff spills out into front page of the paper fights. And that, he could do a lot of things and he'll reach out to people. But I got to say the last thing, the reason why it's really important for him is because of energy and he doesn't have it now and, and Trump does. He leads in the polls, but Trump has the energy. We've seen that race before. And that's why Trump is president. But what I do think that matters here is that and important to understand from my perspective at least is that when people don't have a job when 60,000 people probably will die and 50 million people I mean we're we're getting to the point where a lot of the economy's pop, propped up by PPP funding and so that runs out in 8 weeks either extended or it's going to come back we could have 50 million people unemployed but we're for sure going to have 40 million people when you have 60,000 people have died within the year and 40 million people unemployed. Ain't nobody talking about climate change. Ain't nobody talking about bump stocks either or, you know, assault rifles. Ain't nobody, the, 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 the outline issues are over. The big question of the campaign is going to be who can rebuild the country. The Democrats will have a fight. I think that's going to be the big question of the campaign. And I think that, that Joe Biden has one chance to consolidate the party and he can talk about climate change and he can say whatever he wants to, and he can come to the left on Medicare for all. And he can, you know, blah, blah, but he has one chance to get that right. And uh, I think we'll learn a lot about his campaign when he makes that decision. I filibustered that a little bit, sorry, but. No, no, um, always, always interesting to and get, I know, a, get a and view. I know nothing about what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I, um, there's, there's, yeah, I think that it is an interesting choice. Um, look, I work for an organization that works to elect pro-choice Democratic women, so I was very glad to hear that he was going to put a woman on the ticket. Um, I don't think it's hard to pick a woman. I think there are a ton of qualified ones. Um, and so and you listed some of them. Um, Gretchen Whitmer, I'd throw in there Michelle Lujan Grisham, um, who's a governor in New Mexico, um, who's done, doing a fantastic job out there. Um, maybe Catherine Cortez Masto. I think that um, there's some great candidates. And I think the, um, I, you and I are going to disagree on whether or not Stacey Abrams was the minority leader in Georgia. She did a lot of great stuff. Um, we may disagree there, but um, I think that uh, I think that one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that Joe Biden has held the job before, and he views it as a partnership because that's what he had with Obama, and I think he views it as an important part of governing, which might lead to 
a, a little bit of a Hillary Clinton decision, right? Who can I govern with? Who do I think is going to do a good job? Now, I don't think that lets out people who are exciting. I think that um, I think that there's a lot, you know, that we saw on the trail. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, Kamala's launch event was huge and was great, and um, you know, in a 27 person primary where a lot of the press is going to the two people who have run before um, nationally, it was hard to break through. But I think, you know, she would be really interesting. I mean, I think all the people you listed would be interesting. I do think energy is important. Um, and I do think that uh, this is a big moment to consolidate. I'm not sure I, I would argue it's the only moment to consolidate because I think that those voters are the ones looking at some of those issues um, that that won't matter to a lot of the swing voters. Um, but but I think that it, you know one of the things you have hit on one of the important issues that the presidential campaign is going to come down to, which is where do you where do you swing those 80,000 votes? Um, and it's not exactly 80,000. It depends on where the you know where the numbers lie. But um, but fundamentally, that's what Hillary lost by, right? Um, and so where do you swing those votes? Um, and is it those same states? Do you open up? Listen, I'm from North Carolina, and I'll always believe we're a swing state. Um, I know that Tillis's um, numbers don't look great, um, and I'm. Cal Cunningham is a Tar Heel, so I'm biased. But um, you know, I, I think that there are some states that could be interesting, depending on um, uh, who he picks and and where we are. And I think that um, I I hope that we get an election where we can get out there and really hit the road and talk to voters, or at least find new ways to talk to voters. Um, I'm with you. I don't think now is the time to to do that. Um, but I hope that changes soon. And I look forward to whomever she may be, um, to the vice presidential nominee, um, bringing some, you know, bringing some, some excitement around there. I mean, I think, you know, fundamentally women voters are the majority of the vote. Um, and I think that uh, women have driven a lot of, you know, in 2018, we flipped the house in, in large part because of women voters who came out who don't usually came out come out in the midterm in, in a lot of our races anyway for Emily's list um, women voters were you know we saw them march we saw them lead you know movements and things like that um, and so I, I think they'll be looking to this VP with a lot of um, with a lot of anticipation and a lot of excitement. You guys are great at reading my mind. So my next question was actually about uh, the Biden, uh, the. Pick. So I'll go ahead and uh, skip to my next question, which is, um, in what ways will COVID-19 change campaigns and strategy on a presidential level? And that will go to Christina first, I believe. Oh, shoot. I was hoping Jeff had this one first. Me too. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think in every way, you know, we're doing a lot um, at Emily's List right now to work with our candidates on how they deal with it. You know, we've been doing webinars on everything from shifting your events online um, to how do you think about voter contact when you can't knock a door, you know? Um, and, uh, and then also how do you, um, you know, what is the appropriate time to do different things? How do you keep the campaign going? Earn media is really difficult right now um, for any candidate, particularly any challenger trying to get out there. Um, and so I think in so many ways, everything changes. Um, and, and what is particularly difficult right now, um, and you, you saw this right when we moved our convention, is that we don't know exactly when things will, um, when things will change and it's hard to predict. And so I think that makes it really tough for candidates. Um, you know, I am very, I'm very pleased with what our candidates are doing so far, particularly like our house incumbents have been um, continuing, you know, they, they brought in a bunch of money first quarter, they're ready to go. Um, I think, unfortunately, that fundraising will continue to be important because a lot of, you know, they're going to have to be on the air um, and they're going to have to contact voters um, via more expensive ways than having volunteers knock doors potentially. So I think it uh, changes it in a couple of ways. First, um, the Trump, the collaborative Trump 
constellations have a $200 million funding advantage over the constellation of Democrat campaigns. And, and one of the most important things is, so Biden's campaign was the worst campaign of any of the top 10 at raising large dollar donations. I'm sorry, small dollar donations. And so small dollars has really fueled the presidential politics. And so when you have a poor small dollar operation, the only thing funding campaigns right now are small dollars. Because large dollar donations, you kind of got to, you know, split a beer with them or hang out at a, and take pictures with them in a wine cave that Buddha just talks about. Um, by the way, Hall wine is fabulous. I know it's a Democrat wine, but it is what it is. Um, so the, when large dollar fundraising being kind of off the table, $200 million is really hard to make up. And if you put all the joint fundraising apparatuses together and put everything together, one donor can write a pretty large check, but the, to, to all the committees, and, and I, I'm sure the Democrats do it, the Republicans do it, it's about 500,000 bucks. One donor can give 500,000 bucks. Um, one couple can give 500,000 bucks. But the real money, that sounds like a lot of money, it's a lot of money for sure, but in presidential politics, when you're raise a billion, you really are fueled by giving 35 bucks a pop, and Biden's terrible at that. And every day that we're in shelter at home or shelter in place, he can't do those. And even when that lifts, I mean, I think we're talking about June or July. So another reason why I think the VP pick is pretty important because they're just, you know, it's a lot to catch up with. So that's one impact COVID has. The second impact that COVID has, and most of the, um, aside from Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, most of the swing states have early voting. And so Wisconsin didn't, um, early voting and vote by mail and kind of the same, kind of constitutionally the same thing. A lot of Republicans think, and I don't know why they think this, they, they must not review, they must not read peer reviewed academic research. I mean, we, we win better, we do better among early voters and, and non election day voters than Democrats do. I don't know exactly know why, and I feared it for a long time too, but as long as they don't stack the books and cook the books, we're okay. Cooking the books is where you just put voting centers in places where Democrat live, the Democrats live and not where Republicans live. But if, if it's a general, easy approach, all people can go vote, then Republicans do a little bit better, about 0.8 better than Democrats do early voting. So I don't fear that. Wisconsin was a train wreck, though, because Democrats put the, the, uh, the super, so Supreme Court on the same day as a Democrat presidential primary. Somehow we ended up eating the shit sandwich that, that you know, is our fault that we wanted to have the election that day. But whatever about that. Early voting uh, is going gonna, is gonna to have to be part of the equation. If you can't knock doors, you can't do voter contact, it goes to a digital atmosphere. Digital atmosphere is based solely on motivation because you have to click on something. When, when you have a, a, voter, a, a volunteer at your door, you have to go open the door. But once you do, you allow you know, yourself to be engaged here. And you kind of got to answer the door. It's kind of weird to sit in your house and the door's knocking and the doorbell's ringing and you're not answering it. So it really forces your participation. So that's a benefit. I think that's a benefit, by the way, to Republicans again, because Democrats are better at that. They're better at the ground. Their voters live closer together. They live in, you know, half the population live. You know, if you take out New York and 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 uh, in L.A., which, by the way, is a big thing. But if you take those two out, Trump wins the election by 600, 600,000 votes or so. So their voters live closer together. It's easier to knock doors when you live closer together. Republicans are spread out all over the place. So I think COVID has an impact there. But lastly, I'll say the COVID impact is, and we'll see how this goes. And I looked at, I read Morning Consult today in preparation for tonight. If, if you believe, I'll say economic numbers first. If you believe this is an economic crisis or a health crisis, so economic first, health second. The Republicans believe this is an economic crisis, 50 to 44. Independents think it's 37, 57 economic to health. And Democrats think it's 2072 economic to health. And so just think about that. Democrats think that it's 72% this is a health crisis. And this is April 23rd. Republicans, the same day, think it's 44% a health care crisis. That tells you the fear that people have about 
their own well-being and their and their neighbor's well-being and their family's well-being and their loved one's well-being. All a crisis, all bad. Don't take my words out of context. Um, as this goes on, and provided we don't have a flare up in September and October and all that kind of stuff, that lagging indicator means that the health care concerns here, if it's, if it's already getting like this in April, it will probably be gone. So COVID will probably have washed out of the system. So I think a lot of this fear of what it's gonna do and our Republic hanging in the balance with hanging chads and all that sort of thing, if it's not washed out, then we got big problems. And the strength of our Republic is gonna be tested because we have a close election and a close election today and COVID, if there's any healthcare concerns, if people are fearful to go to the polls, then our Republic is gonna be strained to its limits because we're not gonna know who won this election for like two weeks. And I know what it looked like in 2000 to find out, to take two weeks to find out. That was pretty tough stuff. This would be a whole new thing. I actually think that hopefully that as voters get more comfortable and people want to get moving and, and we get testing and, and, and vaccines and all the things that take place, that hopefully like this wall washes out of system and it's okay. But if not, the problem will become if new states have to vote early people typically don't early adopt. And so it takes a long time when you pass early voting in Kansas is 65% vote early now. And so, but if the first year they did it, it was about 15% and it's continually gotten better and better and better. So it takes a long time to get used to that. And so the COVID impact on that, hopefully I'm saying, hopefully it's passed by then, but if it's not, then this, we're gonna have a real mess on our hands because people do not early adopt. There'll be a lot of problems just like there were in Wisconsin with early voting, a complete mess. Democrats won, a, won early vote by 10, 10 points better than they won election day. And it was still, the, the, the Journal Sentinel called it all kinds of names about what, it was, what a mess it was from, from a voting procedure. And our democracy at this moment in time shouldn't take that. We have a hard time taking it. So I have one final question, and this would be the time for audience watching on our live stream on our YouTube channel to start putting your questions in the YouTube chat function so we can answer your Q&A. So if you'd like to start doing that now, that would be great. My final question um, is that for, we'll start with Jeff first. If you could give one piece of advice to President Trump and another piece of advice to Vice President Biden on how to proceed with their campaigns, what would you tell them? Well, this could get me in a lot of trouble, right? Um, I'll start with uh, Biden first. I think there's, I think there's like, and Christine's gonna know a lot more about this than I will, but I'll take a stab at this one first. Um, there's probably a lot of anxiety right now because Trump's on TV. Again, he's getting the Sunday night football type of ratings. Everybody's freaked out. He's not able to travel. He's not. I think he's like, this is going to be, this is some of his best moments. And that the, the longer he, there, there's a reason why he was almost an afterthought in the Democrat primary for a year. And it's because his, his, um, we did, we did nine focus groups in seven States in the first quarter before all this COVID hit. And we didn't talk to any Republicans. We talked to conservative Democrats and, and uh, independents, and soft independents. And we didn't ask a lot about the presidential, it actually wasn't about the presidential. We had a couple of Senate races and some house races that we cared about. So we did focus groups, but we just word clouded. I'm a big word cloud guy. I care about word clouds more than anything else. Like what people say about people and what they say about the campaigns and messages. And um, the, the, the one thing, the one phrase that they said about Joe Biden over and over again, and this is before he was the nominee, was he's lost a step. That was what they said about him. And this isn't, again, rank and file Republicans. He's lost a step. That's a dangerous thing because his gaffes that he always kind of had and his kind of cute and, and adorable mistakes that he makes, now it's going to go to competence. They're going to view that through a lens of competence, not through just, you know, kind of a slip of the tongue, which he's been doing since he's 29 let alone 78 or whatever he is now. Um, so I think that the one piece of advice is just calmly chill out. It's okay. There's going to be plenty of time. Pick, a, pick just shy of a whacked out liberal as your VP nominee, just shy of it, and run a base campaign because a base campaign 
the Trump campaign is going to run a base campaign. You got to run a base campaign against the base campaign. You can't run a center center campaign against the base campaign. That's my advice. That's terrible for me to say that out loud. Anyway, um, my advice for the uh, for the Trump campaign is, I think they're I think voter reg is probably the the whole game for them. I think the states, the Democrats do voter reg a lot better than we do for a variety of reasons. Some of them kind of institutional, um, their donors write checks for voter registration. They write checks for things that they don't, they don't immediately see ROI on. Our donors don't particularly do that. Our donors, they want to write a check and see an ad go on TV the next day. They want to write a check and see a digital ad pop the next day. They don't invest in kind of institutional things quite as easily. Some patriots do, but most don't. So I think that they need to, while they're in the in this kind of moment of suspense, they need to think hard about a 100-day voter registration place because these races in, by the way, I think New Hampshire's in play, but in New Hampshire and Wisconsin and Michigan, these places that have been historically under kind of valued by presidential politics have really a lot of opportunity for campaigns to come in and organize. They're all Democrat kind of led states now from the governor's perspective. Most of them by the state legislators are all, you know, the houses of of the legislature are Democrats. They probably have some narrow advantage on early voting. <clears throat> and so I think they have to go in and if they could register 50,000 people, you know, new voters turn out 60% of them in the five battleground states, I think it'd be a well use of the resources and time. Don't think about the day-to-day -day fighting over the bow that typically campaigns get consumed by. Don't leave it to outside groups because you never can trust them. Don't leave it to Republican apparatus because you can't trust it. Like you got to do it yourself. You got to put the resources in to do exactly, exactly that. Um, so if I were to, uh, and I, I try not to advise campaigns that I'm not actually working on because as, as, as Jeff knows, we've all worked on campaigns where everybody and their brother had an opinion, but, um, but since you have asked, um, I will, um, I'll say, you know, I would have advised Joe Biden pick a woman um, as your VP and he is already doing that. So um, I'm happy for that. Um, I think that it's um, I think that it's to make sure that that Joe Biden is um, gets out and talks about the things that Joe Biden is most um, passionate about, which I would argue are, are the economy and health and jobs and healthcare. And I, I think that those are the two things that actually fit with him and who he is. Um, and I think that they are the two issues that voters are going to care the most about. It's 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 what I think I would argue did it in 2018 um, for so many Democrats. I think it's going to be an important issue with what we're dealing with now. It's always an important issue in terms of expense and things like that. And jobs obviously are going to be the number one thing. And I think that's where Joe Biden comes from. And that's something that he can talk about in a compelling way um, when he gets the chance. Um, I, my advice for Trump, and I, I do not make it my business to advise Republicans generally, um, but would be, uh, you know, there was a period on the campaign when um, they got him on teleprompter for about two weeks. Um, and, you know, his rallies weren't quite the same, but um, I would say that if right now he were doing these briefings and he would stay on prompter or stay on you know, a very specific message, kind of give the Mike Pence, the messages that Mike Pence is delivering right now, I think the press would give him so much outsized credit. Um, it would be the moment that Donald Trump became president. It would be, you know, him being presidential and he would still have all of the Donald Trump of, of, of what draws people to him, but he could actually argue that he had stepped into this role. I don't think this is gonna happen, but I do think that if he did it, um, the, the, the response from the media would be pretty dramatic. Um, so that's my, uh, you know, it's easy to give advice that you don't think the, the opponent will take. So there's, that's, that's what I would say, I guess. Thanks, Jeff and Christina. We're going to go on to audience uh, Q&A. The first question we have looks kind of specific. It's from Mandy Snodgrass. Her question is, are there 
any specific strategies you would employ to market a generally likable candidate to voters from multiple backgrounds? And this would go to Christina first, yes. Sure, um, just very briefly, I mean, I would say the, the first thing, and this is likable, unlikable, whatever, but particularly if you have a candidate that is good with talking to people, um, find the ways that those people communicate and get there. So, you know, um, get, you know, they're talking to um, ag community, get them on farm radio, right? They should do, I mean, you know, the, the Pete Buttigieg media tour worked for him. I might argue a part of it is that the media loves a like young, you know, um, a young dude who's, uh, you know, ahead of his time. Um, but I also think it's because they literally went everywhere. They talked to Eater. They talk to, you know, you name it, they talk to them. Um, and I don't think that's, you know, you have to have the right kind of candidate, but if a candidate is good with the media, I would say um, find the, what are the outlets? What are the blogs? What are the places and, and get them there. Yeah, I think uh, consultants can be, um, and managers can be um, too ironclad about, about our candidates. Um, every candidate has a strength and a weakness. And you have candidates that typically I try and boil it down to what is their, what, where are they best? Are they best one-on-one? -on -one? Are they best in a round table of 10? Are they best in a group of a hundred? Or do you need to get a thousand people to get them where they're really good? And that's also how long you can spend with each candidate, how long, how good are they for how long one-on-one -on -one is what you're really kind of getting to. So if you have a good one-on-one -on -one candidate, just put them out. It's they're comfortable, they're, they're gonna, that means they're probably gonna make mistakes here and there, but just put your candidate in the most comfortable frame for them. Don't force them into round tables if they're not a round table candidate. Don't put them on a stage in front of a hundred people if they don't connect through a microphone. Like that, I think it, for us, it's always, we want, I mean, part of this might be laziness actually, or part of it might be that we think that everybody's got this in them that they get to go speak to 10,000 people and wow the crowd and, drop the mic and all, and they're just not, they're just not all made that way. And so rarely can you find somebody that's good in a room of 10 as they are a group of a group of hundred. There's very rare talents that can do that. And then they typically eventually have a surname president or Senator or governor, because it's a very difficult skill set to do that. So my advice is don't think, you know, everything. I mean, and I don't know you Mandy, but let your candidate skill set drive the strategy, don't try and drive it through them or around them. Our next question comes from Kate Kemper and she asks, um, you both talked about using social media during the campaign and how more is better. Does that also apply to a person who's elected president? And uh, her second question is, um, the current president uses Twitter frequently but how would it differ um, with other social media? I'm guessing like Facebook, Instagram, that type of other outlets. Is that for me first? Yes, sorry, Jeff. Okay, that's all right, that's all right. So um, the first question again, so I got the second one on the, how to use the social media. The first question was though, how do you, what, it, what is the, uh, how do you use social media? Yeah, I think it, I think it, the question was, does an elected president, is it a good oh. thing for an elected president to use more social media versus campaigns using a lot of social media? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, boy, does it get any more authentic than Trump's Twitter feed? I mean, I mean, it's authentic as it gets. There's no filter. The governor's off. I mean, it's just rolling down the hill. The brakes are out and here it comes. And so um, I think voters in a way, um, re, re, respect authenticity. So I've been part of a campaign that's been much ballyhooed that had 27 approvals for a social media post. And if you want to know which candidate that was, just Google 27 approvals for a social media post. You know who it is. Um, and, I've, and I've had candidates that, and, and I have them now, that it's, I've got alerts set up in my phone to see when they say something stupid so I can hopefully get them to delete it really quickly. But the reality is that, that the, um, the authenticity and for certainly, I think it's even more important as an elected official as it is a campaign because an elected official, they're gonna have 
broader outputs, more things to say, more impact on what they say. It's going to delineate them from other people that are, that are able to take policy positions that can actually translate into real life legislative action. So I, don't, I think they should be almost forced to tweet. <laughs> um, as far as, you know, the, from the, from the social media realm and, and, and how to use it, the second one was how to use it in a campaign, right? Yes, and if uh, other social media platforms besides Twitter, oh, right. Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, so Twitter, Twitter's, you know, I mean, it's going to be the death of us. It's 3% of the population uses it. It's only for insiders. It's total snark. The only thing you can do is be a smart ass on it. I mean, it's just, that's the medium. It's fast. It's snarky. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's for only insiders. It's a completely different medium. Uh, Instagram is obviously more video and more, you know, this is like the best parts of my life. And this is how kind of clicky and funny and, and more genre specific. And Facebook is more aimed at people, you know, uh, that are older and they're reading and they want to show content and they want to like, that's essentially almost like a news channel for them, which is really surprising. So there's the mediums that you use. Instagram is a genre specific, younger audience, younger. I mean, I'm almost 50 now. So younger audience being, you know, 35 and under, it's more your kind of best life and, and meet, you know, the kind of moment. Twitter is like that, like so fast, so insider, so snarky. And then Facebook is more content that you can share and you can deliver and you can impact your kind of friend zone. So that's how I think you use the two separately. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add to that. I I, I think that um, you know, Twitter is where you reach reporters. Um, you know, that's that's a lot. You know, it's not it's not as many voters so much, um, uh, but it's where you can influence that sort of thing. Um, but yes, I think I think that everyone should. Be, I mean, I I go back to Jeff's original point: more content, get yourself out there. Um, let people think that they, you know, think that they're seeing you. Um, I mean, you know, part of what, part of what is compelling about Trump's Twitter feed is that it doesn't sound like a normal politician's Twitter feed. Um, it's just like, you know, what was interesting about, um, you know, what was interesting about Mark Warner's tuna, tuna melt was that it wasn't a typical politician thing, right? Um, and, I, you know, I think that that's, um, that's the thing that people should remember is, um, you know, the voter almost expects it now, right? They want to see some, um, some piece of you. Uh, and, you know, you're better off letting them see it, you know, the, the more you, you divvy it up into little pieces or censure it along the way, the more you ensure that, um, that those things matter way more than they should. So I, I'm, I'm with Jeff on the more content is better. I think we have time for one last question, and it is, are there any specific instances in American history that you think relate to the buildup of the 2020 election? And how do you think we can reflect on our history to help guide our actions in 2020? Um, I, you know, I mean, I think you can, you can certainly make comparisons. I think there are people that might compare it to 9-11. Um, I, I would argue, no, I think this is a unique time. I think this is a very unique president. I think um, too often we try and say this, this person is like this, this race is like this. And frankly, too often we try and run the last race. Um, and this is a new race. Um, you know, just to look at the Democratic primary, we've never had, you know, more than one woman run at a time. We've never had, you know, this many candidates. It's never, I mean, everything, I, I would argue things were pretty different heading into, um, uh, into March. And then I think everything has just changed since then. And, you know, like I said, we're still figuring out 
how that's going to change, when it will change back, how it changes back, and how we do voter contact in the midst of all this. And, um, you know, I think that elections are always changing a bit from the last election, but that to me is, is pretty unique. Um, you know, to reflect on history, I mean, I do think good good practices are good practices. Um, and so I, I try not to run the last race, but to learn what you can from the last one um, and learn some of what worked. Um, so I, I think that's that's part of what we can do. I know that's that's not the best answer, but um, but to me, this is a pretty unique time. So, um... Thank you to thank you for having us. I'll the thank yous out of the way before we kind of take tackle the last one. I always enjoy coming back. I never thought I'd come back on Zoom, but my mother's very upset that I'm not back because I always see my mom when I come back for this and come back for Easter and Christmas. So she missed out on the Dole Institute program this year. So anyway, thanks for having us. And I do appreciate um, the candor that everybody has and the respect that they have for both sides. And it's good to to meet my new good friend on the left. We'll probably see each other on a panel here or there in the future or across the battle lines. Um, I think that there's a, um, this is very, feels un untraditional that, but you know, it's mainly because of the hype that, that the uh, partisans give it. There's about 70% of the people saying this is the most important election of their lifetime. And about half of those are Republicans and half of those are Democrats and they're kind of partisans on both sides. This is the fear of this election. And this is really, codified over the last few cycles, but the Republican Party is is electorally determined by us getting 60% of 70% of the white vote. So 70% of the votes white, 30% is non-white, and Republicans, if we get about 60% of the 70%, it's really kind of hard to lose. Um, Democrats are kind of structurally organized around getting 85% of 30%. And um, if they get that, it's really hard to beat them. And so that can draw some battle lines and some parents and some really dark, terrible outcomes politically. And um, when we're in a time when Christina and I, although I'm an MSNBC, you know, aficionado, at least until nighttime, it's hard. 11th hour, I'll, I can take the 11th hour. But, um, and I'm sure she's a deep, you know, fan of, of Hannity, but, um, but it's hard for us to really cross. We don't watch the same movies. We don't, besides Tiger King, we don't watch, we don't buy the same cars, we don't eat at the same restaurants, we don't have the same habits, we don't live in the same zip codes, we don't, our kids don't go to the same schools, and we're slowly, slowly kind of migrating off the grid one way or the other from other parties. It's it's actually, you know, unusual for me to, to have a dinner party where I'm, you know, the only Republican, I'm typically with other Republicans. And so that's the way we're starting to organize ourselves, and when you have a, such a such a bitterness, not just between the parties. I mean, it's really between the people. And if we take that and manifest it electorally, it is really it could be some dark days. And you can support Donald Trump and not be a racist, and you can support Joe Biden and not be, you know, have dementia. And I mean, all the stuff that goes with this stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, we still have to have a country in 200 days that we can all live in. And so, my, you know, kind of preaching to the choir here at the Dole Institute, who was a man that manifested his life with these principles of inclusion and acceptance and, and involvement. And thank you for carrying on his legacy with this. Um, it's really important that we conduct these campaigns within the kind of contours of what society will accept and not drive to the worst of us, but to the best of us. And so that doesn't mean we don't beat the hell out of each other on ideas and principles and topics, but we keep it between the grid lines. So I think that's the thing that I'm looking for in the, in the next cycle, uh, in, this, in this cycle, moment in history, I don't want to have one. And uh, I wanted to have a battle that's, that's hard fought and nobody, it doesn't take very long into the Google pages to know I can campaign tough, but there's a difference between tough and destructive. And so those of us that are pros in the business don't do it that way. It's the people that aren't the pros that try and do it in a destructive way instead of a determined way to advance your policies and positions and candidates. So thanks for having me. Sorry I couldn't be there. I had to wear a suit. I have cut off sweats on and my daughter's got to come in and make fun of me before I did this. So thanks for that uh, and hope to see you all soon. 
Thank you both, Jeff and Christina. You guys always provide just phenomenal insight that I know that our guests at the Dole Institute and the people watching on our live stream um, always really enjoy, especially the students. We just learn so much, especially since we're still so young. So I appreciate you guys uh, joining us for this program and making it work in an online format. Um, excuse me. And thank you to the audience members for watching. Thank you.